Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. The title of today's webinar is Shared Decision-Making Tools for Lung Cancer Screening. This webinar is sponsored by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. My name is Monique Cohen, and it's my pleasure to serve as the moderator for today's presentations. I am a health scientist administrator at ARC, where I manage several translation and dissemination projects to facilitate informed and evidence-based healthcare decision-making. In particular, I lead the John M. Eisenberg Center for Clinical Decisions and Communication Science. I work closely with the Evidence-Based Practice Center program, and I support initiatives to implement shared decision-making in clinical settings. Today's webinar is the fifth in a series of webinars that are organized by ARC Share Approach Project, which features expert speakers discussing topics related to shared decision making and the use of patient-centered outcomes research, or PCOR, to facilitate patient engagement in their healthcare decision making. For those who are interested, recordings of all of the past webinars conducted in the, in the series are available at the web address listed here, and these webinars are available for enduring continuing education credit. We are pleased to have with us today two esteemed presenters, Dr. Robert Volk from the Eisenberg Center and the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center, and Dr. Richard L. Street, also from the Eisenberg Center, Texas A&M University, and Baylor College of Medicine. This webinar event is accredited by Professional Education Services Group. It is important to note that neither the presenters nor the sponsors of this event have any financial interest to disclose, and no commercial support was received for development of this learning activity. For those of you who are interested in receiving continuing education credit for participating in this activity, information about how to claim your credit will be provided at the end of the presentations and will also be emailed to you after this webinar. Just a brief note about questions. Uh, we have reserved time at the end of the presentation to address participant questions. However, during the presentation, feel free to submit questions that you have for the presenters using the Q&A panel located on the right of the PowerPoint slides. As a reminder, participants are in a listen-only mode, so to ask questions, you will need to use the Q&A panel. The learning objectives for today's webinar are for participants at the conclusion of the webinar to be able to, one, explain how shared decision making can be helpful to patients and providers in deciding whether to participate in lung cancer screening, two, describe the key components of an effective lung cancer screening toolkit for use in primary care settings, and three, explain how using an effective decision aid and other tools can meet the shared decision making and patient counseling visit requirements of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services for Medicare coverage of lung cancer screening with low-dose computed tomography. Before we get started, I want to say just a few words about the John M. Eisenberg Center for Clinical Decisions and Communication Science, which is where the shared decision-making tools that will be discussed during today's presentation were developed. The Eisenberg Center is funded by ARC to develop and disseminate evidence-based resources, such as research summaries and decision aids, to help patients and consumers, clinicians and policymakers make informed healthcare decisions. When developing resources, the Eisenberg Center follows a rigorous protocol and works closely with the ARC-funded Evidence-Based Practice Center program. The Eisenberg Center also partners with federal agencies, medical associations, consumer and patient advocacy groups, hospitals, healthcare systems, and other organizations. If you're interested in learning more about the Eisenberg Center and its resources or signing up for email updates about new products that are released, please visit the Effective Healthcare website at effectivehealthcare.ahrq.gov. And now I'd like to introduce our presenters for today. Dr. Volk is a professor in the Department of Health Services Research at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. A decision scientist, he heads the Shared Decision-Making Collaborative at MD Anderson, where he was also named Outstanding Patient Educator in 2012 and received a President's Recognition for Faculty Excellence Award in 2016. His patient decision aids have received two Telly Awards and a Platinum Hermes Creative Award for Best Film and Video Production in the Area of Healthcare. 
Dr. Volk serves as a member of the steering committee for the International Patient Decision Aid Standards Collaboration, which recently published a series of standards for developers and users of patient decision aids. These standards serve as a blueprint for developers of patient decision aids to ensure comprehensive evidence-based principles are used consistently as new patient decision aids are created and existing aids are evaluated or updated. He is co-principal investigator of the Eisenberg Center and the lead producer of four patient decision aids developed by the Eisenberg Center for ARC. His research focuses on issues of decision making under conditions of uncertainty, particularly among cancer patients with low health literacy. His recent PCORI funding focuses on promotion of informed decisions about lung cancer screening with low dose computed tomography. Finally, he was recently named to the advisory panel on communication and dissemination research for PCORI. Joining him today is Dr. Richard Street. Dr. Street is a professor of communication at Texas A&M University and professor of medicine and director of the Health Decision Making and Communication Program at Baylor College of Medicine. Over the past 25 years, Dr. Street has developed an extensive program of research examining issues related to healthcare provider patient communication, in particular patient involvement in care and the pathways through which communication can contribute to better health outcomes. He has edited two books and plus published over 100 articles and book chapters. He has also served as a principal investigator or co-investigator on several NIH, ARC, American Cancer Society, and Texas Advanced Research Technology Grants. Dr. Volk? Well, thank you, Monique, for, for the introduction and also special thanks uh, to the SHARE program coordinators for making this, this webinar possible, and I appreciate everyone spending some, day, uh, some time with us today. So why don't we begin with a case? Um, so let's, let's talk about a 60-year-old female who presents for a periodic health examination. She mentioned seeing a large billboard along the highway uh, showing $99 lung cancer screenings at a local medical facility. She asks, Doc, should I get that lung cancer screening test? I've been smoking for 40 years. What do you recommend? Well, it's important to begin with um, some discussion around the National Lung Screening Trial. The National Lung Screening Trial was published, the main findings were published in 2011. And in the NLST, over 50,000 heavy smokers were randomized to one of two intervention arms. Um, some were randomized to receive low-dose computed tomography. Others were randomized to receive chest X-ray. The intervention involved three annual screenings, and smokers were followed an average of six and a half years. The main finding from the NLST is that screening with low-dose computed tomography resulted in a reduction in lung cancer-specific deaths of about 16 to 20 percent. This really is a game changer. Um, this is the first evidence that we have for a secondary preventive strategy for lung cancer shown to reduce lung cancer-specific mortality. It really is a landmark clinical trial. But the NLST also showed that lung cancer screening with little CT carries potential harms. These harms include radiation exposure exposure from the initial screening and additional imaging if patients are found to have an abnormal um, initial screening result. Also, the NLST had a fairly high false positive rate and a high positive rate. Um, so 20 to 25 percent of scans were found to be positive, and over the three years of the NLST, that rate jumps up to 40 percent of scans. Of these positive scans, again, most were not lung cancer. In fact, only about 1 in 20 of the positive scans were lung cancer. The rest were false positives. Lung cancer screening can lead to invasive diagnostic procedures. It also can lead to some incidental findings, and these findings may be of benefit to the patient. And then there is concern about overdiagnosis or detecting lung cancers that are never destined to cause death. The rates that have been published range from 10 to 20 percent, but there's a lot of debate about how precise those estimates really are. Well, as you can imagine, the response from the healthcare community was immediate. Um, Direct-to-consumer marketing uh, campaigns were launched. 
uh, some of these offering inexpensive lung cancer screenings. We saw some as low as $99. Um, at the same time, clinical guidelines were being updated. The American Cancer Society, ASCO, ACCP, NCCN, all updated their guidelines in large part um, in response to the NLST findings. Um, these guidelines all share an emphasis on the importance of informed or shared decision making in helping patients make good decisions about lung cancer screening. Also, all these guidelines maintained an emphasis on smoking cessation and smoking abs uh, abstinence for people who are not currently smoking but still may be eligible for lung cancer screening. Well, shortly thereafter, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force updated its clinical guideline on screening for lung cancer, and they published their updated uh, um, recommendation in December of 2013. They also used comparative modeling to address some interesting questions. Um, the task force was interested in the interval, the optimal interviews, uh, interval for screening. Recall that the NLST screened people three times annually. Um, the task force also considered the age at initiation and when to stop screening. They considered the pack year threshold and the 30 pack year threshold in particular. Should that be lowered or should that be higher? And then there's also questions about years since quit for people who are no longer currently smoking. And here is the task force recommendation. I'm going to go ahead and read that because this is very important. So the task force recommends annual screening for lung cancer with low-dose computed tomography in adults aged 55 to 80 years who have a 30-pack-year smoking history and currently smoke or have quit within the past 15 years. Screening should be discontinued once a person has not smoked for 15 years or develops a health problem that substantially limits life expectancy or the ability or willingness to have curative lung can uh, surgery for lung cancer. The task force goes on to emphasize smoking cessation counseling in a couple of ways. They talk about primary care providers providing uh, counseling before a patient is referred for screening and for patients who self-refer and show up for screening on their own, they recommend that the screening centers incorporate smoking cessation counseling. This is a very new activity for the low-dose uh, uh, screening setting, um, and it is, it is encouraged by the task force. So the importance of the task force recommendations really are, are, are multiple. The task force is a trusted, unbiased developer of evidence-based guidelines. The recommendations from the task force can impact the recommendations of other professional organizations and do have the potential to impact clinical practice. And most recently, recommendations from the task force that receive a grade A or B are now uh, covered without patient copay following the provisions of the Affordable Care Act. Put another way, the A's and the B's are now covered with, uh, without copay. Well, the Centers for uh, Medicare and Medicaid Services also took a look at the lung cancer screening question and offered a national coverage determination in February of 2015. And again, I'm going to read through this because it is important. So Medicare will now cover lung cancer screening with low-dose CT once per year for Medicare beneficiaries who meet all the following criteria, age 55 to 77, this is a slight difference from the task force recommendation, which went up to age 80, and for people who are currently smokers or have quit within the last 15 years, people have a tobacco smoking history of at least 30 pack years, so that pack year threshold is consistent with the task force, and that the beneficiaries receive a written order from a physician or a qualified non-physician practitioner that meets certain requirements. Medicare goes on to require a visit for counseling and shared decision-making on the benefits and risks of lung cancer screening. And then they offer additional requirements for radiologists and for imaging centers. This is the first covered service that explicitly requires shared decision-making. This, this visit for counseling and shared decision-making is new. 
and it will be reimbursed, or it is reimbursed by CMS, and we'll talk more about that in just a minute. So let's look more closely at the criteria from CMS. So eligibility age is 55 to 77 years. Patients need to be asymptomatic, that is no signs or symptoms of lung cancer. The 30 pack year threshold is retained and the patient needs to be a current smoker or quit within the last 15 years. CMS goes, goes on to require a written order for low-dose CT screening. The initial service, the beneficiary receives a written order during a lung cancer screening and shared decision-making visit from a physician or a qualified non-physician provider. For subsequent visits, the beneficiary receives an order during any appropriate visit from a physician or qualified non-physician provider. CMS is now requiring a specific visit to discuss the harms and benefits of lung cancer screening before a patient is referred if indeed the patient decides that lung cancer screening is right for him or her. Here are some of the more specifics from the, uh, the CMS national coverage determination. So determination of beneficiary eligibility includes age, absence of sy symptoms, pack years, and number of years since quit. And this needs to be documented in the medical record. CMS goes on to require a shared decision-making visit and they specifically call for the use of patient decision aids. And these aids should cover topics including the benefits and harms of screening, follow-up diagnostic testing if that's needed, the issue of overdiagnosis is included, the false positive rate and total radiation exposure need to be part of these patient decision aids. CMS also calls for counseling on the importance of adhering to uh, annual screening and the importance of considering comorbidities and ability or willingness to undergo additional diagnosis or potential treatment if a cancer is found. Counseling on the importance of uh, smoking um, abstinence or, uh, is, is, or cessation is a major part of the CMS recommendation. And then finally, a written order is required that includes the uh, beneficiary's date of birth. CMS wants an actual pack year history number included in that written order. They want an indication of current smoking status or number of years since the uh, beneficiary has quit, a statement that the beneficiary is asymptomatic, and then the NPI number for the ordering, the ordering physician. They go on to emphasize some additional requirements for radiologists, and I'm going to skip over those very quickly here. They also have some requirements for the Radiology Imaging Center, and I do want to highlight that third bullet listed here, um, that the centers make available smoking cessation interventions for current smokers. This is something very new for radiology imaging centers, and there are significant challenges that need to be addressed in um, providing these smoking cessation services um, at, at these centers. Well, so we'll talk a minute about, about billing and reimbursement. Um, so CMS has now issued two G codes uh, related to lung cancer screening. Um, the first code is for the counseling visit. So the counseling visit to discuss the need for lung cancer screening is now a reimbursable activity. And this is a separate activity from the patient actually receiving the screening services. We've included the link um, to the CMS information about these new codes. The point here, again, is that CMS is reimbursing the conversation, the counseling visit about lung cancer screening separate from the actual screening itself. And this makes a lot of sense. You could imagine a patient who goes through the process of learning about the harms and benefits of screening and may decide against screening. But what CMS is saying is that primary care providers should still be reimbursed for that activity independent of the patient's decision about whether or not to be screened. CMS also offered some guidance in finding accredited uh, designated lung cancer screening centers, and you can go to the CMS website to find those designated centers, and that list is growing all the time. So screening on a national scale. Um, so new clinical recommendations really 
place primary care clinicians at the forefront in implementing lung cancer screening. But are we ready? Well, we at the Eisenberg Center um, decided to develop a new implementation toolkit for primary care clinicians to address, to address this need. And I want to stop for a moment and make a few points about shared decision making and also sort of serve as a, a, an entree for some of the uh, comments that um, Dr. Street is going to be offering um, in a few minutes. Um, first of all, shared decisions require good communication between clinicians and patients. Decision aids provide a structured approach to doing this. They provide structured information about options and trade-offs, help patients think about values that are important to them, and helps foster deliberation. But we all recognize that patient decision aids are not sufficient to ensure a high-quality shared decision-making process occurs. So in developing the new toolkit, we considered a number of different issues. We wanted to provide clinicians with a concise summary of the current clinical evidence and the recommendations. We found that was very important, and clinicians had significant needs around understanding the current evidence and what the recommendations were. We wanted to provide a way to ensure that the patient counseling and shared decision-making visit occurred and was consistent to the CMS beneficiary eligibility criteria. We recognized that a high-quality decision, patient decision aid was important, but was not enough to ensure that a, a high-quality shared decision-making process actually happened. And we wanted to create tools in multiple formats that were flexible so that they could be adapted for various settings um, and, and really um, speaking to the needs of, of the end users. So I want to pause here for just a moment to talk about our development process. I know this uh, question has come up um, in some of the um, questions that were already submitted online. So I'm just going to quickly talk about how we developed our tools before I get into demonstrating them. Um, so in developing the patient decision aid component of the toolkit, we followed the International Patient Decision Aid Standards Collaboration um, guidance on, on developing tools in large part in anticipation of national certification efforts for patient decision aids that are really just starting to get underway. But we wanted to be ready to, to speak to those um, as these certification efforts move forward. Also, when you visit the ARC website and look at this particular toolkit in patient decision aid, you will find a reference document and it's titled About the Decision Aid. And there you can learn more about the development team, the target audience, how we involve end users in development, the IPDES checklist is included in this document, the funding sources for the tool, our updating policy, and so on. So for people who want to learn more, um, I want to re uh, refer you to um, our reference document. The evidence sources that we used in creating this tool were the evidence synthesis that guided the task force update and the comparative modeling study. We also carefully went over the recommendation from the task force and their interpretation of the evidence synthesis. We looked at CMS's national coverage determination in detail in the sources that they used and additional publications that came out from the original main findings from the national lung screening uh, trial. We also conducted extensive information and decision needs assessments. We did um, extensive literature searches to identify needs of consumers, patients, and clinicians. We did some formative work here in Houston at MD Anderson with high-risk smokers to understand their information needs. We had the opportunity to survey a large number of primary care clinicians to understand their readiness and challenges in implementing lung cancer screening. And we did some focused uh, key informant interviews with practicing clinicians. Our development team was, of course, uh, multidisciplinary with decision scientists and communication experts. Medical content experts also participated, including Dr. Jennifer Croswell, who's a medical officer uh, from ARC with the task force, and Dr. Cohen from AHRQ as well. Um, user testing involved um, 
providing consumers and clinicians with versions of our prototype tools and conducted, conducting cognitive testing and acceptability testing with those groups. We had a number of revision cycles as different stakeholders uh, gave us feedback on the tool and we made revisions. And once all that was done, we did an external peer review with five primary care clinicians who were not otherwise involved in development of the lung cancer screening toolkit. Okay, so very briefly, some of the implementation needs of primary care clinicians um, were really helpful in guiding the work that we did. So primary care clinicians told us that they wanted clarity about the guidelines and the recommendations. They wanted to know about eligibility, when to start and stop. They wanted to know about insurance coverage and Medicare coverage. They wanted help finding screening centers. This was a very common theme. They didn't know where to refer their patients. They wanted educational tools for their patients, and also they wanted patient decision aids. They wanted um, help thinking about how to integrate um, shared decision making within their electronic health records, and they wanted training for clinical staff on um, implementation. So overall, they really were asking us for toolkits to help with implementation of lung cancer screening. So in March of 2016, we released our lung cancer screening toolkit, and you can find this at the Eisenberg City HRQ Effective Healthcare Program website. Um, this is the main page that listed, lists the lung cancer screening tools. Um, what we did was uh, prepare these tools in, in uh, using highly engaging visual formats, patient-friendly design. We have a consistent look and feel across the tools. We have multiple formats, so the tools are available on the web, but we also have downloadable PDF versions that may be helpful to people in using in their practice settings. As Monique mentioned earlier, the Effective Healthcare Program has produced a number of decision aids, and here I'm just listing some of the other ones that we've been involved with, including our urinary incontinence tool. Um, we have a tool for women with osteoporosis to help them make decisions about medications, and a tool for men with a diagnosis of clinically localized prostate cancer. And you're welcome to, to visit those and, and take a look at the tools. Okay, so I'm going to go over the components of our lung cancer screening toolkit. We first developed a couple of tools specifically for primary care clinicians. So we have the lung cancer screening summary guide for primary care clinicians that is really meant to give clinicians an overview of the um, evidence behind the updated recommendations. We also talk about the new eligibility criteria for lung cancer screening for Medicare beneficiaries. And we present the evidence about the harms and benefits of lung cancer screening using um, uh, natural uh, frequencies or event rates so that clinicians have a sense of how large um, some of the benefits are and how frequent some of the harms are. We coupled the summary guide with a clinician's checklist that, that we're really excited about. This uh, clinician's checklist provides step-by-step -step guidance on how to meet the beneficiary eligibility requirements uh, from CMS, and I'll show you that um, in just a minute. Again, we're really excited about this tool because we think it's something that could be adapted uh, for use um, um, in electronic health records. For patients, we developed a patient decision aid. Um, the decision aid presents information about lung cancer screening. The eligibility criteria are mentioned. We talk about the potential harms and benefits of screening. We help patients think about what's important to them by including a values clarification exercise and also give them some questions to kind of start the conversation with their healthcare provider about screening. Patients wanted information about insurance coverage, so we addressed insurance coverage as, as part of the patient, the patient decision aid. This tool is really meant to help patients get ready for a conversation with their healthcare provider. We see this being used perhaps before a patient sees a healthcare provider um, while they're at the clinic, or it's something that could be made available to patients before they come in for, for an exam. And then finally, we have a tool um, we call an encounter tool. 
This is a abbreviated patient decision aid that's really meant to be used by the healthcare provider and the patient during a clinical encounter. It's a much uh, more abbreviated version of the patient decision aid that includes much of the same evidence, but is in, presented in a way to help foster a conversation uh, between the healthcare provider and, and the patient. So let's take a closer look at some of the um, components of the lung cancer screening toolkit. So here we have the summary guide for clinicians. It's two pages, front and back, um, very succinct. Some of the features in the clinician summary guide uh, include a table um, comparing the eligibility criteria from the task force recommendation and then also the eligibility criteria from CMS. And as you can see here, they largely overlap, the primary difference being the um, upper age at which, uh, at which screening should, should uh, no longer be conducted. We also provide um, some uh, information about the magnitude of the benefits of lung cancer screening from the National Lung Cancer Screening Trial data. These benefits are expressed in uh, natural frequency, so a common denominator of 1,000. If you look at that first row, you see the number of lung cancer-related deaths over the six-and-a-half-year uh, follow-up period, um, and the bottom line is that three in, a few, three in 1,000 fewer deaths from lung cancer could be attributed to patients receiving screening with low-dose CT over three years rather than chest X-ray. We also quantified some of the harms in a similar way, again, using the same uh, denominator, 1,000 people screened. We have the false positive uh, rate given here. We also talk about the number of people who received invasive diagnostic tests and the number of people who had major complications from those tests. Here we have a link um, to finding accredited imaging centers, and that takes uh, uh, people to the CMS website. And then, not to forget the importance of smoking cessation, we include some resources that clinicians can share with their patients um, to encourage uh, smoking cessation or abstinence for people who are no longer smoking. Here's the second component uh, targeted to clinicians. This, this is our checklist. And we've structured the clinician checklist around three steps, things to be done before a clinical encounter, things to be done during the, clinical, the clinical encounter, and things to be done after the clinical encounter. The checklist follows the CMS beneficiary eligibility requirements. And I'll take, that, take you through this uh, very briefly here. So before the clini clinical encounter, the checklist includes the eligibility criteria, and we have them listed here. Also, at the bottom of the checklist, you'll see the calculation for PAC years. We found that uh, clinicians um, wanted to have that reminder um, readily at hand as they calculate the, the PAC year number for a patient. Activities during the clinical encounter uh, map to um, the information that should be included as part of a decision aid, but also the conversation. So using a decision aid is important, discussing harms and benefits, other issues such as comorbidities, life expectancy, and then we can't forget the importance of counseling about uh, smoking cessation and abstinence. And then after the visit, we have the steps needed to make a referral for a patient who is interested, or if a patient dis declines, um, we talk about documenting that decision in the patient's record. On the back page of the clinician's checklist, we have uh, some additional resources for clinicians that can help with the conversation. On the far left, you'll see tips for promoting shared decision-making. Those come from ARC's SHARE program, and I do want to uh, refer people back to the SHARE program to learn more about those if, if they're interested. We found that clinicians also wanted to have some talking points. Um, that they could use with their patients. So we included a bullet list of talking points um, that may be helpful. And then on the far right, you can see some teach-back examples. These are particularly helpful for patients um, who may have lower health literacy and might benefit from a, some additional probing on the part of the clinician to ensure that the messages are being communicated accurately and there aren't any misconceptions. 
here we have the patient decision aid. So this is a four-page uh, patient decision aid that follows standards from the IPDES collaboration. And I'll highlight a couple of uh, components from the patient decision aid here. First, we include information about possible signs and symptoms of lung cancer so patients have those readily at hand. Again, we emphasize the importance of smoking cessation and abstinence. And in all the tools, this um, messaging is, is consistent and upfront, and it's very important. This is a pictograph, which is a visual representation of the harms and benefits of lung cancer screening. It's set up to compare two groups of 1,000 people. The group on the left were screened with uh, low-dose CT, and the group on the right were not. The data that's um, depicted in the pictograph comes from the National Lung uh, Screening Trial. So as you remember from the patient, uh, the clinician guide, the three, in, uh, the three deaths prevented from lung cancer screening, you can see up on the far left uh, corner uh, being depicted in the icon array. Also in the bottom left of the icon array, you can see people who had a false positive result or a false alarm, the number who had an invasive procedure, and the number then that went on to have a major complication as a result of that invasive procedure. This is a way to visually present uh, harms and benefits to patients. We decided to take on the issue of uh, radiation exposure by using analogy. Um, and, and this is driven in part because we really don't know how much radiation is too much. So what we did is um, show the exposure from a single LODO CT scan and compared that to other medical imaging or other exposures that patients might experience in their daily lives, such as flying cross-country um, on an aircraft, um, the average background radiation that someone ex might experience in a year. Uh, patients really like this. Um, they could get the gist message and, 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 and really understood what, what was trying to be communicated here. These are our values clarification questions where patients are asked to think about what's important to them and how concerned they are about uh, various um, results of lung cancer screening. And then also we have some deliberative questions, uh, questions to help patients think about what's important to them. Uh, for both of these, I'm sorry, for both of these, the patient can go ahead and answer these questions if he or she likes and then bring that in um, to the office visit to talk with the healthcare provider about their concerns. And then finally, we have our encounter tool, which is a two-page, very much abbreviated version of our patient decision aid. It retains the icon arrays. Also, some um, narrative description of what the uh, magnitude of the harms and benefits are for patients, so the clinician and patient can really talk through those. We um, have included the values questions also in the encounter tool, again, to be a prompt to talk about what's important to the patient in considering lung cancer screening. And as you'll notice, the stop smoking messaging is part of the encounter tool as well. So that's our new toolkit, again, with the four different components supporting a patient decision aid. We felt it was important to not only create a patient decision aid, but other tools around it to really help with, with implementation. So now I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Rick Street uh, to talk about communication strategies for clinicians and really help us think more about how the toolkit might be helpful uh, when implemented in the clinical setting. So, Rick, if you'll take it from here. Thank you, Bob. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about how you might uh, use this aid in talking to patients about lung cancer screening. And the suggestions we're going to come up with come from uh, two different sources. One, as Bob talked about, the SHARE program uh, that uh, he had mentioned, uh, Mark's uh, tips for shared decision making. And then the other comes from the Choosing Wisely initiative that how clinicians and patients can have informed discussions about treatments that the need and appropriateness of certain treatments and tests. So let me go through these um, uh, r relatively quickly, and then I'll talk about how that might be handled in the consultation itself. So the first suggestion here about providing clear information, well, that's obviously not rocket science, is it? Of course, that's what we always try to do. What we're talking about here mainly is optimizing information management and meaning. 
Now, if you go back to the clinician guide that we had earlier, we talked there was some talking points about the risks and benefits of lung cancer screening. That could be something that you can use and talk to patients about. But the important thing is that when we're presenting information about how we use various forms of expression available to us, like everyday language or graphs or examples or analogies or stories, but we, re we will not know how well our, our, what we're telling folks is understood or if that information is clear until we check for patient understanding. And that is a very important thing that, that we need to do. And that's also some examples that were given on that uh, clinician guide on uh, things to consider when handling these con conversations. So I've put a couple of examples here. You know, I know you've gotten a lot of information and what stands out is particularly important to you. So we've talked about possible harms of lung cancer screening, what do you think about those risks? You could probably come up with any number of examples, but what's important here is that when you ask questions like that, it then puts the, the onus on the patient to then respond with something, and then that allows you to get some insight of how they're making sense out of what you're doing. But important things to remember, and this is something that I, I like to harp on all the time, Information has no meaning until someone makes sense out of it. So that's why you need to make sure and, and checking at how a patient is making sense out of it. There's obviously no one way to provide clear information, and the key is to provide information in a way that the patient can understand it. And as I had mentioned already, it's important to check for patient understanding. All right. A second strategy is to elicit uh, patient's beliefs, concerns, preferences, et cetera. Hear what, they're, what they know. Uh, find out what they're concerned about, find out what they want. And you've got to set those up with questions to get them to talk about it. Uh, so we could ask them a, 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 about what they think about a lung cancer screening. But the, a thing I think we need to remember is, is I think sometimes, at least in some cases, we think of concerns um, and preferences as being misinformed or as being um, misguided. And I, I think we need to be careful about that because to the patient, this has reality and, and, and is rational and it makes a lot of sense based upon what they know and want. So the key there is trying to talk about what the information you have that's important for the, for the patient to know and try to integrate that into a knowledge base so that they can look at things a little more broadly or fill in some gaps that they have. But importantly, try to connect that information to the patient's values and preferences uh, and things like that. So, uh, so what if a patient says, and you, you all could probably find some, you know, other examples of this, you know, more in line with uh, those of you that are clinicians with regard to how you handle these conversations. Well, if lung cancer screening can save my life, then that sounds good, right? Okay, if it's a possibility, I want to go for it. And then the doctor might respond, that's right, it could save your life. But remember, the research I was showing you shows that out of 1,000 people, three lives would be saved and 18 still died. And 350 had a false alarm, and some of these people had additional tests and complications. So what do you think when you compare the numbers of lives saved with false alarms? You kind of get the, the, the gist of what I'm talking about there, trying, how we try to make sure as patients have a certain way of looking at things, we make sure they're considering the other side of the, uh, of, of the, of the situation with regard to, you know, the risks and benefits. All right, um, the third and last thing is to try to reach mutual understanding and, and agreement. And by this, I mean we need to be real explicit about what we're going to do and, and, and about what we know. So we sometimes tend to take for granted if a person's nodding their head and things like that or if I, they're talking and I, I, we take for granted that we already know kind of where they're coming from, uh, what, what they know, they understand what we're saying. And we need to be careful about that sometimes. So periodically, if you um, uh, are concerned, you might need to check for the patient's understand or your understanding of the patient's perspective. So this is where we get a lot of those reflective kinds of responses, things like, so what you're saying is if there's at least some chance to save your life, um, you want to do it even if the odds of a false alarm are much greater, okay? Get the patient to confirm or say, well, no, not exactly, what, whatever the way, direction that conversation goes. Let me see if I got this right. You think the likelihood this could save your life is quite small, and you're really worried about what would happen with a false positive. So those are things that most of folks probably do periodically, but they're a good thing to do to make sure that you understand where the patient is coming from. Uh, I didn't have a good example on the second bullet. Uh, check the patient's understanding of, of what you have shared uh, with the patient, including any concerns you have. 
So this kind of sounds like an awkwardly worded uh, statement. So you know what I'm concerned about. I'm talking about that in the sense where, you know, if you have some reservations that the patient is not taking into account certain considerations, then it would be trying to get them to understand that you may think it's important for them to understand that particular point or that particular issue. Now, if we, the other thing to consider now is we've talked about some communication strategies for how we might handle these kinds of conversations. But let's now, uh, well, uh, uh, first of all, let me conclude with that. So we want to strive for common ground or the best course of action and then mutually acknowledge the action to be taken. And there are a couple of uh, simple examples given there. But let's, let's talk about the kinds of patients you're going to have these conversations with. One kind of patient will be a patient that already has, like Bob's example earlier, they've seen the billboard or they've heard it from someone, or maybe they even had the decision aid. They come in and they have some conception of what lung cancer screening is, and they have some preferences related to that. So they come in already with, with a, a knowledge base of what they think they know about it. That's very different from the patient who might be kind of, uh, I, I don't know, I've never heard of it. I'm not familiar with it. And those conversations can be handled, should be handled a bit differently. So if the patient already has a knowledge base, like in that first uh, example, one of the things that I think is important is rather than jump immediately into talking about the risks and benefits of lung cancer screening, let's first ask the patient what they know about that. So ask the patient about what his or her thoughts are about lung cancer screening. This lets you understand what they know, what they find important, and importantly, what gaps that they may have in their understanding. Then you can fill holes and have that conversation depending on where their starting point is. Um, if, even if a patient says, oh, I don't know, you know, I heard something about it, but, you know, I really don't know much, you can still follow up with a probe, something like, well, well, with regard to what you've heard, what are your thoughts about it, before you then get into the conversation with regard to um, um, the talking about risks and benefits. Now, if the patient has no or very limited knowledge of lung cancer screening, this is where, in particular, that uh, decision-making tool, that communication aid, becomes very important in order to help educate, identify concerns, and discuss uh, uh, preferences. So uh, I'm going to go up here to another slide uh, that Bobby showed earlier. So here's the decision-making tool for the clinical encounter. And so what you have here is a document that y'all can share together in which it talks about, you know, the risks and benefits uh, there on, on the page on the left-hand side. We've got the part, like Bob was talking about, in the middle to try to get some patient's thoughts about preferences and values clarification and things like that and some opportunity for them to have questions and, and things. So this could actually be something that you could use uh, in the encounter. This is also something the patient could have and should have and filled out before the encounter if the decision aid is given to them before the encounter so that then they can come here and they already had some of this filled out so that you can go over it uh, with them. Uh, excuse me, let me go back to where my slide was. Um, mutual understanding and agreement. All right, and so those would be things that you might have with regard to your thoughts about how you might con uh, conduct the consultation, depending on whether the patient knows, uh, has any previous knowledge about lung cancer screening or not. Uh, so in conclusion, I think what we would uh, suggest here uh, in terms of how these things might be used is that we need to adapt the tools for a variety of primary care settings. We need to integrate the tools with electronic health records, like Bob was mentioning earlier, and adapt the tools for different populations and then couple these tools with clinician training in shared decision making. Um, and so that uh, is the conclusion, the content of, um, of our presentation. Here are Bob's and my uh, contact information, and we would be happy to, um, if there are any questions or if people want to follow up with either of us on this, we'd be more, more than happy to uh, uh, answer any questions or, or, or to get back in touch. Well, thank you for um, for those presentations, and um, this concludes the presentations for today. And we're now going to use the remaining time to address questions from the audience. Um, but before uh, we do that, um, just take a moment to jot down the link on the slide if you're interested in receiving continuing education credits for this activity. Um, the information will also be emailed to all participants following the webinar. 
So um, let's move to questions. Um, as a reminder, please use the Q&A panel to send us your questions, and please direct the questions to all panelists so that um, we can address them. Um, so we received a number of questions related to the shared decision-making visit. Um, um, a few people asked uh, what kinds of clinicians other than physicians um, can engage patients in that shared decision-making visit and still be covered? Yeah, maybe I can speak to that. Um, so I'm looking at the um, information from CMS about um, the updated billing codes, and CMS talks about the visit being furnished by a physician or qualified non-physician, meaning a physician assistant, a nurse practitioner, or a clinical nurse specialist, and then they um, have a specific uh, uh, citation for that. So again, if, if you, um, I, I have a link to this document in the slides, and you may want to take a look at that to get further clarification um, um, on those issues. But that, that's the, the language that um, CMS has offered. And so another question was around um, patient preferences for engaging in those shared decision-making um, visits. Do you, do you um, know if there tends to be more preferences towards having those, um, those conversations with one type of clinician um, versus another? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure if um, any research that um, you know, addresses preference for the, for the type of clinician, that, that, that's really, really interesting. Um, Rick, have you seen anything on that? I have to admit that I have not. No, no, I haven't. And this is relatively new. Uh, and so I don't, I'm not even aware of much research um, that has done any um, uh, research, at least l looking at patients' preferences and, and the communication on these kinds of topics uh, in these, uh, in, in, for lung cancer screening. Mm -hmm. Um, so what, um, do you know uh, what, um, uh, what people could expect in terms of um, the number of patients who might decline screening following shared decision making? Is, it, is there any information about that or is it still too early to tell? Yeah, it's, it's really too early to tell. Um, you know, when, we, when we look back at some of the other cancer screening questions, it, it's really kind of a mixed bag. Um, for example, prostate cancer screening um, with uh, the prostate-specific antigen assay. When, when patients um, participated um, in interventions that provided information about harms and benefits and encouraged them to have conversations with healthcare providers or receive decision aids, there actually um, is a reduction in their interest in PSA testing and a reduction in um, their actual completion of testing, um, which is interesting to see. Mm -hmm. at, at the same time, when we look at colorectal cancer screening, the, the use of patient decision aids seems to increase uh, the, the colorectal cancer screening rate. Um, so it is a bit it is a bit of a mixed bag. Um, if I had to venture, you know, an hypothesis about this, you know, people are very smokers know that lung cancer is a very real uh, risk for them, and, and they're concerned about it. Um, I'm, I'm guessing that the rate at which people decline will be fairly low, but again, this, that's just a hunch on my part, and, and again, it, it is too early to, to, to really know. Mm -hmm. um, is a uh, separate screening visit required um, to order the LDCT um, separate from the screening visit? No, that is, it is my understanding that is the same visit. So, so the order can be placed at the time the patient participates in the patient counseling and shared decision-making visit. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and, uh, so we have a question about um, does the shared decision-making need to take place after the first year of screening or is it only required once? Yeah. Um, so it, it's my understanding, so if we're talking about um, the CMS beneficiary eligibility criteria, it's required the first time. And, and if a patient is interested, they can receive um, the referral later. Um, and I don't know that the task force is specifically, specifically speaks to that. 
Um, but it, at least my understanding, the way CMS is weighing, weighing in now, that, that it's required for that first referral. Okay. Um, so um, I wanted to ask some questions about um, the age range, age range, and so you had mentioned some differences in the upper age limits uh, between the task force and CMS. Um, could you talk a little bit about that, or sure, what the differences yeah. are? I could tackle that one. Um, right. So the preventive services task force used age 80 as its upper limit, and um, that number was based on some of the comparative modeling that they did that showed there was a benefit um, screening patients up to the age 80. Now, the National Lung Screening Trial, though, only in, um, included patients up to age 74. So, so it does have an upper, uh, uh, higher um, uh, age limit than what was used in the, the National Lung Screening Trial. The CMS beneficiary eligibility includes screening up to age 77. And it's my reading of the, the beneficiary eligibility requirement that the, the thinking there is if a patient starts screening at age 74, they should receive the full three years that people in the NLST trial received. So again, people in the NLST were screened over three years. So 74 years old plus three gets you up to the 77-year-olds. My understanding that's the reason for the, for the upper age limit. Mm -hmm. So what about patients who fall below the 55 age minimum or are above the 77 upper limit? Um, what should be done um, when treating um, those patients? Yeah, well, so, so following the, the um, recommendation and, and following CMS, they're not eligible um, for lung cancer screening. So, so they would not meet eligibility criteria. Right. So I, I think then, you know, what to do with those patients is to really, you know, enforce the messaging around smoking cessation and smoking abstinence, be, be, abstinence being the most important thing you can do uh, to lower your risk of developing and dying from lung cancer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so in terms of the development of the decision aid, um, can you um, talk a little bit about how long it took to develop the resources and what types of um, uh, clinicians uh, were involved in um, providing input? Yeah, I'd be glad to. Um, so the um, toolkit was developed during uh, one contract year. Um, the development process spans about nine months of that. So there's some upfront work that is done as we select topics, but we do all this within um, a single contract year. We were careful to um, talk with some key informants before we, before we launched development. So these were primary care clinicians, um, practicing clinicians who, who could give us some feedback on sort of where their concerns were with, with implementing the, the new recommendation. So we, so we did some interviews uh, with them to understand their challenges, um, what they thought would be um, particularly helpful in doing that, in, in uh, uh, creating an implementation toolkit. We also had the opportunity to survey a large number of primary care clinicians to get a sense of what they were doing now. Um, and the timing of that study was after the task force had issued its updated recommendation, and then about the time that CMS was um, completing its final national coverage determination. So the draft was already out, and people um, could have been aware of that. Um, we were able to um, uh, obtain surveys from about 300 primary care clinicians and really found that um, you know, a, a small minority already had lung cancer screening programs in place, um, but they really had some significant needs um, you know, around implementation, and they were the real practical things. You know, like how do I find a, a, a certified radiology center? Um, we need patient decision aids and patient education materials to make this happen and so on. So, so again, that, that's how we involved um, clinicians during development of, of the tools. Okay. And, and um, let's see. How, how um, or what mechanisms um, or plans are in place to make sure that the toolkit stays updated? Yeah, so that's a really important question, um, not only for the lung cancer screening toolkit, but 
patient decision aids in general. So the IPDES collaboration does speak to that. And it's important to have an updating policy in place uh, when someone releases a patient decision aid. And we've included our updating policy as part of the reference document um, that's available online called About the Decision Aid. Um, but really two things would trigger um, an update of the tool. One would be new evidence um, that comes out um, uh, about lung cancer screening harms and benefits that might trigger the evidence base that informed the task force recommendation being re-looked at and then any of the, the products that have been um, developed as a result of that. And then also we just think it's good practice to you know, look at the literature periodically um, and, and just look at the tool to, to periodically to make sure that the messaging is still you know, on target and um, that we have things um, reflected um, appropriately. So that's like every one to two years or so we do a re-look. Uh, to make sure that, that, that things are appropriate. But the big trigger would be, would be you know, new evidence being released that somehow impacts how we would, would describe harms and benefits. Yeah. How long would you expect a, a clinician um, to take in order to complete the, um, the counseling visit um, using um, the resources from the toolkit? Yeah, another great and difficult question. Um, my sense is that, and, and I think what's perhaps um, you know, the, the, the concern with, the, with this comment is primary care clinicians really don't have a lot of time um, to um, have these, these conversations with patients. They're dealing with multiple other things, patients' comorbidities, office visits are quite slow, are, are quite um, limited in the amount of time that's available. A lot of what we're hearing in, in my sense going forward is some of this may actually be done by other clinicians. You know, so, so nurses, for example, may, may take on some of this, uh, some of this activity um, around the shared decision-making um, making visit. And that, I, I think, would take some of the, the pressure off a, a physician, for example, who's, um, who's doing this. Um, but how long it will take I mean I I really don't know and, and you know, we, we haven't we haven't looked at that looked at very that very carefully. I think it's gonna vary um, in part based on sort of where the patient has is at when when they start that conversation. If somebody with a lot of concerns or someone who really has little information um, about lung cancer screening, you know, that that conversation may take a little bit more. But at the same time, the patient decision aid can help the patient prepare for that conversation. So that's kind of a roundabout answer. We, we, we really don't know how this is going to, how this is really going to play out in clinical care. Um, so um, some more questions about the development of your toolkit, um, it, it, specifically in, um, related to the involvement of patients and in, um, in patient input in, um, as the toolkit was being developed. Can you speak a little bit more to that and just clarify the patient's role in that process? Sure, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd be glad to. So in, in developing the tool, we sought uh, patients' input as we um, considered the messaging that, that we wanted in the tool. Um, so that's where, for example, the, the issue of providing information about insurance coverage came up. Patients were adamant that they wanted to know um, about you know, who was going to pay for what. Um, once we had a prototype available, we did focused cognitive testing with patients where they would look at a mock-up of the tool and, and um, tell us in their own words what the information was trying to convey. And, and that proved very helpful as well as some messaging wasn't quite right. We needed to, to do some tweaking and so on. Some of, some of the challenges that we had from the cognitive testing with patients um, were things like, you know, they, they really struggle with the concept of, of overdiagnosis. And, and I don't think we've, um, you know, been able to address that in, in the most optimal way, but there really isn't good you know, literature out there to, to, you know, offer any direction on that. It's just a very difficult concept for patients to understand. They also um, confused the concept of a false positive with overdiagnosis. And again, you know, that, that proved to be, a, you know, a very um, difficult issue for, um, for patients to understand. Um, 
so again, we did cognitive testing when we had mock-ups um, available to folks. We also did acceptability testing to get a sense of did they think the tool would be helpful to them? Was the length about right? Were things clear? Did it present information in a balanced fashion? And uh, changes were made, uh, made iteratively um, throughout that process. So, so based on the um, the work and the testing that were, was done with patients, would you say that um, the tools are appropriate for use with um, patients who have lower health literacy? And then are there any strategies um, that you want to add um, to help um, clinicians who have a large patient population with low health literacy? Yeah, so that's very a very, very important issue. So, so the patient decision aid has a lot of information in it. And, uh, for example, if you look at the icon array, that, that's very difficult for someone to negotiate on their own if, if they're not used to thinking about, about numbers and, and comparing rates across, you know, for example, screening and not screening. It's really very, very challenging. Um, so it, I think it's important um, for clinicians to really use some of those strategies that we had in the in the checklist, like the, the teach back um, technique being um, particularly important to sort of probe the patient's understanding and um, really clarify some misconceptions. The encounter tool also can be helpful with that because the clinician and patient are looking at that together, and they can they can explore that together. Um, so, uh, can the shared decision-making um, visit or discussion take place during a routine office visit, or um, does it need to um, be scheduled as its own appointment? Do you have any information on that? I, I don't, and we need to check with CMS about what they they decided to do. So, so the, I think the question is um, sort of same-day visits. So if a patient is coming in for some other visit, can you also have a, a visit during that same day for lung cancer screening? I haven't seen that that issue has, has I haven't seen a final, uh, final guidance from CMS about that. There was a conversation we were having early on. I, I think we need to get some guidance from CMS about that. Um, so regarding um, uh, the high, um, um, the, the high positive or false alarm rate, um, there were some concerns about that in communicating um, some of that information to patients. Um, do you have any, um, any tips or strategies on how to do that? Well, I think it's important to um, couch the high positive rate um, within the context of sort of what happens next. So for a lot of those people, um, they may simply be watched. Um, some people may come back in for additional imaging to, to see if there's been a change. And it's really a very small number that go on to have um, invasive diagnostic tests. And, and, and those numbers are given um, you know, in, in the pictographs. So, so I think it's important to, to when talking about the high false positive rate, to, to really emphasize that these are the consequences of it, and the vast majority of people may want to have additional imaging or may be watched, and it's, it's a, a smaller subset that actually go on to have um, invasive diagnostic procedures. Now, also, the, the high positive rate and high false positive rate is important to present to, present to patients because most abnormal lung cancer screening scans are not lung cancer. So it's only about one in 20 that actually turn out to be lung cancer. Um, so, so people need to have sort of a lay understanding of what predictive value um, is all about and, and to, to help them really understand that the vast majority of these initial abnormal scans are, are, are not lung cancer. Um, was um, in uh, developing the toolkit, um, did you receive any input from um, staff at CMS? Uh, yes, we did. So we, we did vet the tool um, through CMS and um, um, got some helpful feedback. Um, sort of bottom line is they, they felt that the, you know, the intervention was consistent with the beneficiary uh, eligibility requirements. Yes. So um, just do you have any general thoughts about um, uh, doing these kinds of visits um, using telehealth? Um? 
That's a good question. Rick, do you have any experience with, with telehealth interventions, uh, communication interventions? Uh, I, I do. Um, the, this is the kind of thing that would probably be uh, good uh, in that kind of situation. Uh, so there's so I'm thinking about it in terms of if you're having a, a, a virtual consultation that's live, uh, but it's you know it's mediated through video conferencing or, or things like that. The, the, so so you could do that. These are largely uh, information sharing, information exploring. Um, you know, trying to have conversations about your concerns and about what what you may consider doing. So those are things that would be uh, could 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 be done through uh, a telehealth con consultation. Uh, I think the um, you know, the, the key there would be to make sure that if, if, we, if we have an, a, the, the, uh, the, the aid that's to be used in the encounter, the encounter tool, it would be nice to have both the clinician and the patient have that, and ideally if they've already filled it out, have that together so they can go over it together. Since they won't have the shared physical space that they would have, they would still be able to connect with that by each of them having uh, the same document uh, even though they're, they're remotely connected. So um, in terms of um, uh, getting patients to agree to come in for an initial um, visit, um, do you have any suggestions about that? Um, there's a question about who would do the prep work. Would, um, would it be an RN or a medical assistant? Um, do you do a, a verbal or a written invitation for the appointment? Do you have any suggestions? Yeah, so, so how is this all going to play out? It, it, it's a really interesting question. Um, I, I, some people, um, some clinicians I've talked with have, have mentioned that they're going to um, um, send out um, letter invitations to, to their patients who they know are smokers um, to make them aware of um, screening and uh, if they're interested to, to come in and, and have a visit. Um, it may also happen that, that uh, some of these are caught during a periodic health exam, uh, for example, um, or you know triggered by a conversation about smoking cessation, you know, for someone who's who's um, you know continuing to smoke. Um, so yeah, I, I think there's probably a number of ways that this this is um, this is going to play out. Um, I noticed there's a question about group visits um, for lung cancer screening, which I think is a really interesting idea and could offer some efficiencies um, in terms of providing, you know, the shared decision-making experience to folks um, or, or the information about harms and benefits in particular to get them ready for a, for a conversation. So I think it just um, um, sort of is yet to be seen how this is all going to play out. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of the availability of the toolkit, um, is there a cost um, to access the toolkit? Uh, no, Monique, do you want to do you want to tackle that? One? <laughs> No, <laughs> no. Um, so the toolkit is available for free. You can um, access it online um, uh, through the Effective Healthcare website, um, which was uh, shown earlier. Or you can actually you can order print versions through the um, ARC Publication Clearinghouse. Um, the number is eight hundred three five eight nine two nine five. Again, it's eight hundred. Three five eight nine two nine five. Um, I'm not sure um, if they are uh, if the printing has been completed yet, but you can place your orders now, and they will be sent out to you as soon as um, as soon as um, it's been printed. And also, there is a question about um, whether the tool kit is available in Spanish, and the patient um, focus products are um, are available in Spanish, or they, they will be available in Spanish. They're currently um, um, being translated. So, um, so I don't um, try to see if there are any other um, questions that we didn't answer. And I don't know if, um, if uh, Rick, if you wanted to, or, or Bob, if you wanted to make any, um, any other kind of um, uh, closing remarks. Well, I guess I guess I'll comment, you know, about what an interesting time it is from a policy perspective, and also from, you know, from the perspective of, of clinicians out in practice seeing, seeing patients. You know, this is the first time that we've had policy that endorses shared decision making and specifically calls for for patient decision aids. So, so I think it's a, a really exciting time 
you know, for decision scientists to really think about this, but it's also an incredibly challenging time um, um, in terms of trying to think about how we're going to make this happen in real world, uh, real world clinical settings. So we're hopeful that the tools that we've developed, you know, will be a good starting point for that and would be very excited to hear from people about how they're thinking about using the tools, how they might adapt them, uh, you know, for, for their settings um, in particular. Um, so, so we hope that we hope the toolkit is, is, is going to be a, you know, a valuable resource uh, going forward as we're in the midst of this, this new um, experience around uh, cancer prevention uh, in involving shared decision making. The, the only thing that I would add to that, certainly from my uh, communication hat on, is uh, it'll be very interesting to get to understand how these conversations go because there's so many different kind of, of laminations depending on which way direction you take it. So if you look at the of, of, of getting lung cancer screening, and then when you have a uh, you know a, a false positive, then that breaks out into a number of different things that are possible to talk about. So it'll really be interesting to see how decision making patterns uh, work out with that. So that that is 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 it going to be mostly just let's wait and see, let's let's check again later and kind of defer that uh, until the next uh, visit. Or are they going to engage in more aggressive kinds of things uh, in order to see what's there? And those are those will be interesting conversations, and look forward to clinicians' experiences and sharing those uh, with regard to how those go, so that we can get some good ideas about, from a communication standpoint, some of some good practices in that regard. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And, and actually, I, I see there are some more questions that are coming up. Um, so in terms of that decision-making visit, how, how, how do you respond to concerns that um, when people might interpret it as trying to talk um, eligible patients out of being screened? Do you think that that's a concern, and, and what are your thoughts about that? Well, I, I, from my perspective, I think the goal is that the patient makes an informed decision about screening within the context of the best available evidence and after having a conversation with, um, you know, a healthcare provider about what's important um, to the patient. So, so if a patient declines screening but understands the harms and benefits and has, has done that, Come to that decision within the context of a conversation with a healthcare provider. I think we have to consider that probably, probably okay. Um, you know, the data are the data. Um, so, so the magnitude of, of the benefit is, you know, uh, the lung cancer mortality reduction is about 16 to 20 percent, which is more than we've ever had before. So it's really a very, very exciting finding. Um, but the truth is though the majority of patients diagnosed with lung cancer will, will, will die from it. That, that's also a point that I think needs to, um, needs to be made. Um, so at least from my perspective, you know, a patient making an informed decision with, after a conversation with a healthcare provider really is the, the desirable goal. I don't know, Rick, if you, you have some other thoughts on that. Well, I'm thinking on the other side of the coin where a patient is, um, comes in and they're really committed to thinking this is something they need. You know, they've heard about it and, you know, they're a smoker and they're worried about it. And then if you start engaging in the shared decision-making process, well, you also need to consider does that put them into a position to think that you're trying to talk them out of something. And that's why I was thinking and make some of those suggestions about how you want patients to talk about those things first, you know, in terms of what they know and where they're coming from, because that gives you a, 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 a sense of where their, their, their starting point is and kind of where they're going. And then it just all depends on the dynamics of how those conversations go. You know, the quality of the relationship of the two people together might matter. That's how you present um, uh, and, and, and talk about things so that people will consider alternatives in a way that doesn't invalidate uh, where they're coming from. And then sometimes you're just going to be put in a position that, you know, this patient really feels strongly about this, and so, um, you know, that may be, the, you know, that appears to be what we need to be doing, especially since it can be, be reimbursed. So, you know, those dynamics are going to really kind of depend on where that patient's starting point is and how strongly they feel about whatever starting position they are. Mm -hmm. um, 
Can you say um, a little bit about um, the in terms of the toolkit? So there's the um, there's a four page decision aid. Uh, and then there's the um, the, the encounter tool. Um, so, in terms of how patients have reacted to the tools, does it seem to be a preference for one versus the other? Um, and how can the tools should they be used um, together, or should you choose one or the other? I don't, yeah, we don't have information about uh, a preference for for one or the other. They certainly can be used together. Um, the, the encounter tool, I think, is particularly attractive, um, you know, because we do want to help foster a conversation between a healthcare provider and um, and a patient. Um, the, the patient decision aid also can be helpful for someone, you know, sort of prior to that uh, visit to, to help them, um, you know, prepare for it. So I think using the tool, the, the two could be helpful. We don't have evidence that one approach is better than another. Um, and those studies really haven't been been done yet in other contexts. Um, but, but, but again, I think both both have, have value and, and can be complementary. I think having that encounter tool though does um, afford the opportunity to really explore uh, any misconceptions that the patient might have and, and talk about what's uh, what's important to the patient. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so earlier, um, in answering a question, you had indicated um, the types of clinicians who um, could uh, engage patients in that shared decision-making visit. Um, there's a, a number of questions clarifying, were radiologists included in, in the list um, that you mentioned earlier? Yeah, that, so that question is coming up a lot, and, and I do not know the answer to that. We're, we're, we're going to have to get back with CMS for some clarification on it. But yeah, that question's been coming up quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And does the, um, do, do, do you know if the shared decision-making documentation, even though other clinicians may um, be involved in that, but does that need to come from the referring provider? Yes, that, that's my understanding. That the, the Documentation does come from the referring clinician. Okay, so um, I want to uh, thank you um, both, um, Dr. Volk and Dr. Street, um, uh, for the presentations and for um, uh, responding to the questions. Um, we've come to the end of the time for the webinar. Um, I want to let everyone know that um, for the questions that uh, we were not able to respond to today, um, we will um, find, get answers and post the responses to those questions along with the webinar recording in a few weeks on the website. So um, if you have any questions uh, about if you have any questions about uh, our Share Approach program, you can send them to Dr. Elena Fournier at either of the email addresses listed here. Um, and then for questions about the Effective Healthcare Program, the Eisenberg Center, or um, any of the lung cancer screening tools discussed today, you can email me or the um, Effective Healthcare inbox. And as a reminder, um, please use the following web address to claim your continuing education credit. Uh, and I would like to um, thank you once again for the presentations and um, also thank you for all the participants for joining us today. And uh, this concludes our webinar.